praise the Lord. Amen. So, so thankful tonight to be back in the house of the Lord and excited about what God's going to do in this service tonight. I want to take a moment and uh, allow my wife to stand and testify and just share her heart for a moment about what the Lord's doing and what he's done in our life. So thankful to the Lord for his blessings. You know, we, uh, in time and prayer this morning, I was thinking about how that the Lord is so good to us. He's always been good to us, but how he's so merciful and he's so good and he's our high tower. He's our rock and he's our fortress and he's our everything. Amen. Praise God. How many of you feel the same way? I like the old songwriter would say, where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. I, I tell you tonight, I'm excited about so many different things, this being the second night of revival. And uh, if you came back after last night and uh, you were blessed last night, I want you to make sure you give God glory and honor for all that he's doing. Uh, there's been a lot of prayers. I want you to know that any given service, there is so many different parts and, and uh, administrations within a service that prayer from people like your pastor, pastor's wife, different saints within the church, people who may be fasting and praying. I believe God sees all of those things. And when we have a good service, uh, I'm always quick to make sure I let the Lord know I appreciate everything he's poured in. Because I realize it has, it's not on just one person, but it's all of us together collectively seeking the heart of God for revival. But I want to start out tonight by letting you know that we're very grateful uh, for the people that are here, the hospitality that we have already received. I said it last night, and I could say it for the next thousand years and probably wouldn't do it justice, but you have a great pastor and pastor's wife. Uh, they're fantastic people, and they become friends of ours. The only regret that I really have, I just wish we lived closer. I really do, uh, because we would fellowship a lot more. And uh, this little piece of time that we're able to get up here for a few days, if it was up to me and we had the ability and we're a little closer and things were different, uh, we would love to be able to do, you know, a whole week of revival. So uh, anytime that I come up like this, I feel kind of like I've got to put 10 pounds of sugar in, a, in about a five-pound bag. Uh, but with the Lord's help, I know God knows the need of the church. And so I have sought the Lord, and, uh, and I appreciate everything that went on last night. I was encouraged by the altar response last night. It, it, I would say if I had to estimate, it was probably about, what, 95% uh, of the people that were here in service last night were in the altar, and many of them for, for a long time. Uh, I hated to slip out last night. Every once in a while this happens. I don't know if anyone's ever had it. It's called an ocular headache. And uh, my vision in one of my eyes, I'll get these rainbow-looking things, and my vision will go black in one of my eyes. And I want to try to get and lay down for a little bit before I couldn't see good. Uh, but thankfully, it usually goes away after a little bit of time. So I apologize that I had to slip out. But I just want you to know, it just greatly encouraged me to see so many people uh, earnestly. I mean, I'm not just talking about just going to the altar to do their due diligence and service or whatever. You know, I got a position in the church. I don't want anybody to think I'm backslid. I could tell by the way people were praying in the altar last night. There were a lot of sincere people. And that encourages me because it makes me feel like the journey, the sacrifices and everything that you put in. It makes it worth it, you know, to come all the way up here from the swamps of Florida. Uh, but one of the things that I have begun to see uh, over the last day or so as the Lord began to shift my burden for the service tonight, I started thinking about how that many times in revival that uh, God would put a, uh, I guess you would call it a theme, where that one night the, the message was not the same but very similar. And throughout the whole revival, sometimes youth camps will have a common theme. Uh, but in this revival, for whatever reason, I just, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about following the leading of the Lord. And some of you preachers, when I say this, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. But sometimes God just gives you one of those messages. And um, 
And God poured it in my spirit and showed me there would be a shift tonight. And so I'm asking you to be prayerful tonight for me and for the people that are in need. When Sister Tracy began to sing, and uh, before she sang, and she began to testify about what God had, I guess, given her to sing tonight, she had made the statement about people listening to the wrong voice. And when she said that, the hair on the back of my head, the neck just stood up because I just felt like it was like a confirmation in many ways. And uh, you can you can be guilty of listening to the wrong yeah. voice. She sang about needing answers, and possibly there are people tonight that need answers. But I'm going to follow the leading of the Lord with the Lord's help tonight. And would you help me to do that? Uh, I don't know that we might run the backs of the pews. We may not shout. We may just bawl our eyes out. I don't know what we'll do tonight. Uh, but I've got to follow the leading of the Lord. If it's not but just one person. Or two or three or, or a whole bunch of people. I've got to obey God. And I pray that you will help me to do that tonight. Genesis chapter number 13. We're going to begin reading with verse number 7. And if you'll stand to your feet tonight. Genesis chapter number 7. Genesis chapter number 7 tonight. We're going to look there and see what God has to say to us. Genesis chapter 7. I said Genesis chapter 7. It should be chapter 13. My apologies. And verse 7. 13 and 7. I got you all kinds of confused. Genesis chapter 13 and verse number 7 beginning. And when you have it, if you look this way, just say amen. amen. All right. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee. And between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. What was he saying? We're family. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. I want you to look at the very first three words of chapter number 13 and verse 11 here. Then Lot chose. I want you to hang on those three words for just a moment. Then Lot chose. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. With the Lord's help tonight, I'd like to preach something I've never preached before on the tragedy of getting it wrong. The tragedy of getting it wrong. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord tonight and ask the Lord for his help. Father, we thank you for your word's sake tonight. We pray, God, that you will add the anointing that makes preaching edifying to the body. Let the word come forth clearly that it may be palatable and easily to be received. I'm praying tonight, God, that conviction will rest upon all of us. God, that you will allow me to say everything that you have foreordained for me to say tonight, nothing more 
and nothing less. And we will give you praise and honor and glory for the word of God tonight. And everyone can say amen. As you're being seated tonight, if you will, look at two or three people. Look them in the face tonight. You can shake their hand if you'd like, unless you're afraid of COVID. Look at them tonight and tell them we cannot afford to get it wrong. As we look at this very familiar story that many of us that have been around the church have heard numerous times, this story of Abraham and his nephew Lot, we see that they have recently left this place called Egypt. They pulled up stakes and they have traveled southward. And the Bible reveals to us that they eventually, eventually settle uh, between Bethel and Ai. And after some time of being in this place where they have begun to settle into, there arises a conflict of interest between the two families who are as one dwelling together. The Bible says that it's between the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. Well, due to the fact of the way the land was laid out and the fact that God has prospered these two families dwelling together so significantly, they have been increased by God himself. They have got more livestock than they've ever had. They've got a multiplicity of children and grandchildren. And so these two families have grown exponentially. And now they're trying to dwell in a land where there is only so many, we'll call it water holes, place to bring their livestock and their cattle and what have you. And so here they are with all the great possessions and the many things that God has blessed them with. But while the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot attempt to give water to their cattle and their livestock. There arises tension because of these two people trying to access the limited resource that is there in that particular area. There is arguments, there's conflict, and Abraham being the man that I suspect him to be, a man of peace, a man who really loves his nephew Lot, he does not want to see this ongoing conflict. And so he chooses rather an easier route. And so the Bible shows us that he goes to his nephew Lot. And he allows him to see that there is another way out of this. Another plan, if you will. And that plan would be that our two families will separate. And you will go one way, we'll go the other. You'll dwell in one land and we'll dwell somewhere probably close by, but not in the same place. And so in my mind, I see Abraham take Lot up to a high place. And they're looking out over the vast land of that day. And as they look around at the surrounding areas and all the beauty of God's creation... Abraham looks to Lot and he lets him know what I'm going to do. And this was a humble gesture by Abraham, his uncle. He said, I'm going to let you choose wherever you want to live and dwell and raise your family. And wherever you go, we won't go. Uh, and essentially what Abraham is doing here is Abraham is taking the back seat. And he is allowing his nephew to have first dibs or first choice at wherever he wanted to live. And I can only imagine as these two men stand there and they look out at that vast land and all the beauty of God's creation. That we see in verse number 11, the Bible said, Then Lot chose. And I, I get hung up on these three words because... A decision has been made. A choice has been made at this very moment. I was not there. The text does not reveal to us that this decision was made in a matter of seconds or minutes. I don't really know exactly what happened of the details. But what I do know is that when Lot is presented with the opportunity to live anywhere that he wants to live. 
He looks out and he looks at the appearance that the eye sees. Everything that is before him. And he looks in one place and he sees what the Bible tells us are the well-watered plains of Jordan. There is a lot of beauty there. There's a lot of resource there. And it only makes sense to us tonight that Lot, through the appearance of fleshly eyes, would would go to this place or pick this place. I mean, after all, one of the problems that they are having between their two nations or two uh, families, if you will, is the fact that there is a limit to supply to feed and uh, to take care of their livestock. I mean, maybe in the mind of uh, Lot, he's thinking like a businessman. Well, my family's already grown to this place and livestock are reproducing well. And uh, we're going to need a lot of water in years go by, to go by. And so we're going to make sure that we're taken care of. As a matter of fact, some Bible scholars would even say or suggest that they felt as though that the decision that Lot the nephew made in this situation almost comes off as a slight bit selfish. I don't really know, but I just know that he has chose to live in this place. Uh, the well-watered plains, uh, amen, of the, this place of Jordan. So they journey east, the Bible says, and they separate themselves from one another. And by careful study, you would discover tonight that the reasons that he would most likely choose this place is because of the vast resource of that day. It would stand head and shoulders above the, the uh, ability and resource of many of the uh, land that surround that place. And so he has picked this out because of its appearance. As he views it with fleshly eyes, it looks like, somebody say it looks like, it looks like the best thing going. It looks like the place that he ought to go. It looks like everything that he's ever wanted or ever needed. It looks like everything his family might need. But the Bible goes on to tell us that this region that Lot is moving beside. Somebody say beside. Because what I want you to understand, people don't always get this. He did not immediately go right into Sodom and Gomorrah. He moves beside this place. And the Bible shows us that what God has said about this particular place He's moving beside, that it is plagued by wickedness. Sinners who before the Lord that the Bible says. But in Lot's estimation and in Lot's viewpoint and Lot's vantage, it looks like the right place to go. Even though God knows. I don't know. It doesn't seem to me that He got the mind of God. Does it to you? It seems to, to me that by all appearance that He went solely by what it looked like. Come on somebody. Help me tonight because the truth is you can go by what it looks like and make the biggest mistake of your entire life. Oh, that's right. What's even more concerning is that the Bible goes on to say that Lot has pitched his tent toward, in other words, he has positioned his tent toward the direction of this ungodly, vile place, this wicked place. He has pitched his tent toward that place. Well, if that's not enough for you to, to understand how bad of a decision that it is, it is becoming, in chapter number 13, and verse 12 the Bible shows us that he pitched his tent towards Sodom yeah. just one chapter later in chapter number 14 and verse 12 we see that he has now moved into Sodom it only took a little while it seems by the reading of the text one, one step in the wrong direction often leads to another step in the wrong direction and it looks good it feels good but it is not good Say amen, somebody. Oh, but I'm still preaching tonight to the church on the tragedy 
ways of getting it wrong. And this is one of the most tragic stories recorded in Old Testament Bible history. Once in Sodom, we see that that Lot's family is drawn more and more into the customs and the culture and the way of doing things in Sodom. It becomes more of who they are. And if I can be honest tonight, Sister Tracy made a statement tonight singing. She said, this really is not my style. This may not be my vibe, if you will. Uh, but I like the words, and the words are great, and I love the song. And uh, and the truth is, uh, I like a lot of the same music that Sister Tracy does. I, I just kind of, that's my error, my generation. I also like black gospel. I like a lot of different things, but the area that we live in, years and years ago, they did away with all Southern gospel. There is no radio station. So the only thing we have in our area is a radio station called Z88.3. And a lot of what they play, the only thing we have to listen to is a lot of the contemporary gospel. Uh, it's kind of music, if we will. And some of it is not really that bad. Some of it is doctrinally false. And there's just a lot that I don't agree with. But what happens is, and I'm trying to show you, is that the more that we've lived there with no other real options but to listen to that on the radio, it becomes more a style that you inhabit and you accept. And you begin, it begins to grow on you. Come on, somebody. And it, it's not a big deal anymore. And so you, you vibe to the beat and the beat sounds well, but you're not paying attention to the lyrics who are, are, are absolutely, many of them are false doctrinal uh, things laced in the message of the song. And so I'm just trying to tell you, you have got to be very careful that when you put yourself in a place and in an environment that you don't become a part of the environment and the environment become part of you. Say amen. But, but, the, the, but the claws of Sodom and Gomorrah are gradually sinking themselves down into this family. They are beginning to be affected by everything going on. Now this is not a part of my message per se, but I will tell you this is one of the reasons that I don't take picking out where I'm going to be a church member as some haphazard thing. What do you mean by that, Pastor Mark? Well, I have seen people pick churches uh, like they're picking out shoes down at Payless. Uh, you know, uh, this, this pair fits good. Uh, I like the laces on that one. That one's got a real good sole. I hear this one's a real popular brand. Uh, everybody in school thinks that's the flyest shoe on the block. Uh, and so I'll pick those shoes. Uh, there are people that pick where they're going to be a representative of the, of the love of God and receive from the power of God based on everything that is in the human eye. Not by the will of God. Not by where God wants you. Not concerning themselves with what God would have. But if it's fun in the sun. And then we've got everything going. Then that's where I want to go to church. If you're not, you don't believe me, look at some of the local forums online. People when they're looking for a church will often say, I'm looking for a church that's got a program for my, my babies and this and that. And I understand where people are coming from. But how do you expect for local churches to ever grow youth departments if all the youth go to one church? Come on now and say amen. If everybody called to work with children are all in the same church, many of them, you got six or seven youth pastors or leaders sitting on a pew, sitting on their hands doing nothing. Come on and say amen. What I'm telling you is every decision should be weighed in the balance before Lord God, can you say amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I want you to know that as this family is slowly getting the claws of Sodom and Gomorrah sunk down into their lives, we read in 2 Peter where the Bible says that Lot was vexed in his soul for the foul conversation of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah and the ways of the inhabitants of Sodom. But for whatever reason, folks, he did not leave. And I wonder sometimes, why did Lot not leave? 
believe when the leaving was good. There are some places you say, well, my kids are having lots of fun, you know, and this and that and the other. But is it worth the, the is it worth the risk of somebody being defiled in their conscience? Is it worth the risk of being deceived? Say amen, somebody. Oh, but the wicked influence of Sodom is gaining such a great hold on them and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I cannot say one way or the other tonight. I don't know if this is absolute truth, but as I began to study about Sodom and Gomorrah, the family of Lot, there are several different historical accounts that say that Lot had a third daughter. Again, I don't know if it's true or not. I just qualify that. But these resources say that Lot had a third daughter. And while they were living in Sodom, that she was burned to death by the people of Sodom for breaking their law to give charitable gifts to foreigners. And they didn't go along with that. And so they burned her to death. Can you imagine that one day you're standing out on an open plain and you you choose to pitch your tent toward the wrong place. You choose, you make a decision and another day you're beginning to watch yourself lose more and more and more and more. Come on somebody. But the Bible shows us that eventually that God Himself get so disgusted with the vile wickedness of the place called Sodom and with its perverse lifestyle its homosexuality that was rampant I don't know how you feel I don't have time to stay here but it's looking more and more every day like the United States of Sodom and Gomorrah but Lot's uncle Abraham intercedes on behalf of Lot with God. And the Bible shows us that through that intercession that God has chose that he will spare as Abraham has pleaded with him. So God sends two angelic men to lead Lot and his family out of Sodom. If you think it's bad, hang on, it gets worse. When the angelic men show up in the city, to bring Lot and his family out. These angelic men are in the house and they are hosted by Lot. A mob of homosexual men gather on the outside of the house and begin to demand that he sends them out so that they can have homosexual relation with the angelic men. Lot decides to make a very strange decision. Here he is in Sodom and Gomorrah and things just keep getting worse and worse. Lot steps out the door of the waters and shuts it behind him. And he has communication with the mob and he says, listen, I've got some young daughters and they have never been with a man. And I will allow you to be, you understand? And uh, that if you'll just leave these men alone and that's what happens. Somebody say, God forbid. And so the story only gets stranger by the minute. And so finally these angelic men begin to lead and try to get them out and while that we see a complicated situation and you see fire burning off in the distance as they are getting out smoke billowing up billowing up into the into the horizon here is Lot his two daughters and his wife his wife has got Sodom has got such a hold on her heart that while she is on the way out you've heard it said probably before but her feet are pointed in the right direction but her heart is still in the wrong place and the Bible said she looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt of the many powerful short statements that Jesus makes this is what he has to say about this situation remember Lot's wife remember Lot's wife do you remember what happened to somebody who went to the wrong place and let the wrong place get inside of her. It gets worse. Some of you that know the Bible, it gets worse, don't it? 
And if that is not bad enough, as the night progresses, I assume maybe the same night, another night, the two daughters who are left over, it's now just two daughters and one father. The two daughters understand that under biblical implication that one of the greatest things about a lineage is a bloodline that is able to be carried on. They begin to look around and realize we are in a position where that my daddy's lineage and bloodline will not be carried on. So in the night they make one of the most unusual decisions to get their father intoxicated and lie with their own father. Father. Oh, come on, somebody say, God forbid tonight. Oh, but I'm telling you that in the midst of all that they have done, these two daughters end up getting pregnant with two sons. And these two sons, I, well, let me say this first. I got to wonder, Brother Donnie, if their judgment was not skewed by the unusual decision late at night to push them outside the door of the house to a mob and close the door and let the mob have their way with them. Somebody say decisions. Somebody say choices. Amen. Decisions have consequences. Choices have consequences. These two daughters have two sons. And the name of one son is Moab. Moab, that son's name is regarded. He goes on, it goes on to be an entire nation. Anybody heard about the Moabites? Well, one of the sons, the Moabite, he, he is the father of that nation of Moab, if you will. And it, the Moab is regarded as one of the greatest in enemies of God. They were known throughout history for their sexual perversion. Is that any coincidence? I think not. They were known throughout history for their hating of God and despising of righteousness and promoting filth and ungodliness. That's no coincidence at all. Then there was another son. His name was ben Ami, which would become the father of a group of people known as the Ammonites. You see, the Ammonites Ammonites, uh, they were well known as also an enemy of God's people. Right. When they were trying to be exiled or get away, and then the Ammonites stopped them from being able to make crossing through their land. They were always at war, if you will, with these Ammonite people. They were always fighting against the will of God. Is that any coincidence? Come on now, somebody. Always fighting against God's people. And if that ain't bad enough, these people had a God, two gods. One's name was Milcom and the other God's name was Molech. Everybody ever heard of Molech? Molech was that God statue that they would set a fire inside of. And they would bring little babies and children and place them in the burning arms of that Molech God. And them children would die screaming while parents stood idly by offering up babies to the God Molech. And all I can hear over and over. Then Lot chose. We have a saying that many of us have said, and you have heard it probably and said it yourself. If I only knew then what I know now I would do things different I gotta wonder I gotta wonder if Lot could do it all over again I wonder if he'd say you know what that's a little bit too close to comfort you know what that looks like it could be the will of God. But let me get down on my knees and let me make sure that it's the will of God. I am preaching to people who've either made a decision, about to make a decision, or praying about a decision tonight. If that's you, I want you to hear me out very clearly. Every decision that you make should be weighed in the balance before the Almighty God. 
Why, Pastor? I can tell you tonight as a pastor that I have literally watched good people leave a good church because they've always wanted to live in the mountains. They've always wanted to live by the beach. Or they've always wanted to have a job making $25 an hour. And they leave a good church and end up losing their whole entire family. I'm still preaching tonight on the tragedy of giving it wrong. What if you are wrong? What if you choose the wrong thing? How will it affect you? How will it affect your offspring? How will it affect your future? Come on somebody and say amen. I have pastored young couples who that I married them in our church or some other location who later went on to wish they would have never, ever married the rascal they married. Huh? In one such situation, there was a young lady who that actually was a great worker in the church. One of somebody that was close. We loved her like she was our own family. That young lady ended up marrying some guy. But I'm going to be honest with you. As a pastor who is going to call it like it is. I feel like she got to a place of her life. Where that she was tired of being lonely. She had got to a place where she was desperate. Let me explain to you. You don't need Bo standing beside you in your Facebook profile. To make you have validation that you are a beautiful woman. That you are a handsome man. You don't need somebody to tell you how your eyes sparkle or you got hair like rows of whatever Song of Solomon said. Amen. Or you got teeth like a bunch of goats or whatever. You don't need somebody to validate you like that. If you have not first been validated by God, you will walk around the rest of your life with a low self-esteem and there will never be a man there will never be a woman that is smart enough, wise enough to make you feel good enough you need the validation of God if you don't realize your self-worth by now you better find you an altar and find the love of God Uh, I have seen it and in this particular instance The marriage fell apart some time after. She concealed it for some time. But when it came out in the wash later, she was getting a weird creep vibe. She never got that vibe before. They dated, they talked, they exchanged. And I don't know if they do love letters. You do love letters through text message now. Check yes or no through a text. They did the whole thing. But she never one time picked up on the creep factor. But now here they are married. And he ended up doing some things to her daughter that we'll just leave it at that and you can use your own imagination. She immediately decided this is not This is not going to work. She kicked him to the curb. Some time went by. And the same man. I don't know if I've shared this or told this. But it's real and it's something we have experienced ourselves. Some time went by. Brother Donnie ends up that he gets with another woman. And that woman's got a 12 year old girl. Not even quite a a a full-blown teenager yet. And while he is at home laid up not working, she is at work. I don't know. I'm just, maybe I'm too Southern, but I just tell you, I can't hardly handle a lazy fellow. Right. Amen. But while he is at work, or she's at work, he is there babysitting a 12-year-old girl. Mama come home for whatever reason early, walked into her bedroom and found something that no mother should ever have to see. What am I telling you? I am telling you that if you don't take the time to make sure 
you can't afford to get it wrong. Because there are things that can train wreck your life. Come on now. Oh my God. I have watched people that have got out of good ministry positions. Decided this ain't going to work. Left and went to another church. And in the chaos of the transition, they're not even preaching tonight anymore. If they would have just made sure that they knew. I'm glad. Now, I haven't seen this. I don't know what it's like here. But I remember a stint. I want to say it was sometime in the 90s in the church of God down in Florida where pastors were constantly moving around. It was like they were trying to work their way up the ladder to get a bigger church, a bigger parsonage, a a bigger salary. I'm glad we ain't seeing much of that anymore. That is so lame. Come on now. So crazy. That's right. Amen. But they were trying to work their way up the ladder. But one preacher friend of mine, I could say he was one of the greatest inspirations to my ministry. We called him Papa uh, Papa Davis. And Papa Davis was one of them fellows that he would just call it like it was. He would do it in love and you knew he meant business. But he was the one preaching the night that I got saved. So I had a lot of respect and revere for him. We were in a situation. I told you, I'm I'm not too big to tell on my own self. But we had we had left a church because we got looking around at the appearance of the way things were going, and we said, "Well, maybe this probably isn't where we should be." And we decided, "Well, we'll just go start our own church." So we 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 went in that direction, and it was just floundering around like you caught a fish and he threw threw him up on the bank. We were still young in the Lord. We wanted to do something for God. We thought we were doing the right thing. Probably about like Lot did. But one night we went to a revival. I hope to God that somebody gets something out of this. We went to a revival, Brother Donnie. And there was Brother S.J. Davis, Papa Davis. He was preaching that night after the service. We met him in the foyer of the church. And uh, he said, Brother Joe, how you doing, son? And I looked at him, I said, well, we're doing pretty good. I said, we've been doing this little house church thing. He said, is that right? I said, yes, sir. And this preacher just had a way of looking straight through you. He looked in the whites of my eyes with his bony little finger. He began to poke me in the chest. He said, I've just got one question for you. I said, yes, sir. What is that? He said, are you in the will of God? Right. right. <laughs> yes, he did. I said, well, he said, you ain't in the will of God, boy. He said, you took too long to answer me. Right. Come on, man. <laughs> he said, you better get back where you're supposed to be. Right. I'm glad for some men and women of God that when they discern, when they detect, when they pick up on something just ain't right, yes. that they're willing to say, you need to get back where you're supposed to be. Right. Quit playing around over there. Who are you trying to flatter anyway? Right. Get back where you're supposed to be. I wish that I would have fully done what that man of God said. You know why? Because we floundered around for about five to seven years until finally, I thought for sure. So I, I'll never, I'll never pastor. I will never be a part of the church of God ever again. I had already made my stop. We were in the independent movement, holiness movement, and that is it. I will never even, I will never even give consideration to the idea yeah. until God redirected my steps. And uh, he slipped it up on me as the best way I know how to put it because I did not want to go that direction until one day all I know is that God started opening up doors and the next thing you know we've been in the ministry with the church of God now under that umbrella for going on probably close to 18 years now. But I told you all of that to tell you if I would have just listened to that man of God how many years that I could have of dragging my family through the mud and not being in the perfect will of God. S.J. Davis, don't you love older folks' wisdom? S.J. Davis said, son, let me tell you a story. 
He said, and maybe this will help you. He said, I was young in the Lord, preaching, pastoring a church. He said, in that church we were pastoring, he said, all of a sudden, he said, it exploded with growth. He said, we were bussing in several busloads of kids, one after another, every week. He said, it was going, he said, we were breaking Sunday school attendance records. He said, the church was on fire. He said, you couldn't hardly quote a text without everybody shouting and praising God and people being, being healed and such as that. He said, and right in the very climax of all of that, he said, one night, he said, I went down to a place of prayer beside my bed. And he said, I began to pray because he said, I've always believed that a pastor should never take it for granted that he is just in the will of God. He said, always make sure that he is still in the will of God. He said, I got down by that bedside and Brother Donnie, he said, I began to pray. God, I want to make sure that I am in the center of your will. You know what that told me about S.J. Davis? He was not after money. Right. He was not after numbers. Right. He was, come on, he wasn't yes. after position. He was willing to go where God sent him and do what God said. Brother Waters uh, emphasized that tonight because the reality is it's all going to burn up anyway. Right. All this stuff on the earth. What's most important is doing the eternal will and desire of God in heaven. But he said, I was down there and I was praying. And he said, I, I casually said out loud, God, if you want me to leave this church and go anywhere else, just let the phone ring and somebody call me. And, uh, and, and I will know something, you know, you want me to do something different. He said, Brother Joe, he said, I didn't sooner get off the floor. And he said, the phone rang. And he said, you, he said, I tell people all the time, you can say what you want to. He said, but I believe that night the devil heard it and the devil tried to get me tripped up. He said, because when I answered that phone, it was the state office who never called me. He said, the state office said, SJ, we believe you got what it takes. We got this church over here, and they ain't running very much, and they need a good pastor. And they buttered it up real good, you know, like a salesman. And he said, he didn't even really stop and think about it much. He just kind of took it for granted. He said, I'll go. He said, Brother Joe, I will never forget the day that we pulled out of that parking lot by that station wagon loaded down with our kids and about everything we could fit in it. He said, there were, he said the parking lot was slab full. He said there were two rows and lines of people on both sides of the car crying and squalling their eyes out. Please reconsider. We want you to stay, Brother Davis. But he went on and pulled out of the parking lot. He said, it was the biggest mistake of my entire ministry. He said, when I got where I was going. He said that church had a Jezebel spirit and liked to eat us up. He said they went into the parsonage and took all the groceries out of the refrigerator and tried to starve them out. Quit paying the tithes and offering and tried to starve them out. He said it was the biggest mess I have ever been in in my life. He said if I have learned anything and if I can tell you anything boy, he said you better get down and know that you know that you know it is the will of God. What am I saying? You can't afford to get it wrong because there's a tragedy and getting it wrong. You know what I tell young people? When, you, when young people are talking about getting in a relationship, I'll quickly tell them, you'd be better off to be without one than stuck with the wrong one. Amen. You better pray. You better get the mind of God. Right. If you're here tonight, you say, Pastor, I've got some big decisions ahead of me. Yes. I've been praying about a job change. I've been praying about a church change. I've been praying about a ministry change. And I have not shared this with anybody, Brother Myers. But we've been praying about some decisions. And we've got our eye on something. We've got our eye on someone. But I am here tonight with a message during this revival. If I'm not preaching but to one person, I'm obeying God. Because you better know that you know. Because if you're not mindful, you might end up with tragedy like Lot's family. I would to God 
that I could go back and that I could sit down and have a conversation with Lot and say, Lot, you're going to lose so much, brother. You're going to lose that wife of yours. You're going to lose your, your family. You're going to end up with sons, grandsons. I don't even know what you call that. Amen. You're going to end up with sons that are going, they're going to go on to be enemies of God. Whole nations are going to be born out of your loins. One decision after another decision after another. You just keep going down, down. This ain't popular preaching, but thank you, Lord, for the message. Yes. And I want to share with you tonight that there is, this is not the only incident in the Word of God. No. Right. You and I have suffered. When you go out there and work by the sweat of your brow, and you ladies have to travail in childbirth, Preach, you can thank Adam and Eve. That's because why. you know why? Yep. Yep. Their story is the tragedy of getting it wrong. That's right. Yes. Preach. When she looked at that serpent and began to communicate back and forth, yep. well, God said, yep. but you know what? If you can picture in your, moment, your mind for a moment that fruit, as she pulls it to her face, yep. and as she is pulling it to her face, to take a bite of it. She is about to make a tragic choice. Yes, sir. Sure. Was it bad, Brother Myers? I mean, you just look around the world we live in today. Right. But indirectly, or directly for her, Cain slew yep. his own brother. brother. Right. Can you imagine going to Eve and saying, was that thing worth it? Mm -hmm. Was that what you thought it would be? Oh, I can just about assure you, on, right. Sister Tracy should say it was not right. worth it. Right. Right. It was not worth everything that I put myself or allowed myself to be put through. Generation after generation has been affected yes. by that one right. decision. I'm so grateful for the Honeycutt family. And I admire you and your family for all that God has done through you. Today I was getting ready and I thought to myself, if your daddy is looking at you, he's got to be proud. He's got to be. But you know something? A lot of decisions had to be made for all this positive stuff that has gone on. A lot. And it wouldn't be like it is had not your daddy and his family or whoever influenced him. What I'm trying to show you is I'm not just preaching the bad side. I'm telling you when you get it right. Right. Yes, bro. It's like honey from the honeycomb. Yes. Or a honeycut. You might even end up with a whole entire street with your name on it. Can I get you to stand to your feet tonight, if you will, please? Sister Tracy, I think you might be playing tonight, if you will, come to the piano. I am telling you tonight that I have come all the way up here from Florida to just obey God, and whatever that was. And while I was praying to the Lord before I even knew this, when this service would be or all that, the Lord spoke into my spirit these few words. The tragedy of getting it wrong. As we're closing tonight, I want you to stop for just a moment. Maybe you need to close your eyes. I don't know. But I want you to think about somebody you know who got it wrong and have paid a dear price. Was it drugs that took them out? Addiction. Was it bad decisions that led to problems in a marriage that folded and crumbled and left a big disaster when it was all over with? The hurt and the pain that comes after it's all said and done. The daughters, they made decisions. The daddy, he made decisions. 
And fathers and mothers, let me tell you tonight that the decisions that you make have a way of replicating themselves in different forms through them that follow you. And if you don't respect the will of God enough to make sure that you consult God, how can we ever scold our daughters or our sons or our family or our church members because they have not sought the will of God? I'll have people that may come and visit our church and they will say things like, well, we're looking for a church and we would... We were thinking about maybe coming to your church. And after all of these years, as much as I want to see the church grow, one of the very things that I try to make sure I tell everybody, I never try to make people feel manipulated into coming. I will always tell them, we just want whatever the will of God is for you. And we want whatever the will of God is for our church. And if it's God's will for you to be here, I don't want you to be anywhere else. But if it's not God's will for you to be here, I don't want you here. And I say that in love. But as heads are bowed and eyes are closed tonight, I want to ask you, as Sister Tracy plays something on this piano tonight, your head is bowed and your eyes closed tonight. Your eyes are closed. I want to ask you directly, are there decisions in front of you tonight that you are about to make or you have recently considered I'm not talking about what grade of gas you're going to get when you pull up to the pump. I'm talking about things that could affect the rest of your life. When I considered moving in a church when my kids were still at home, I had to pray for the will of God as if that decision I made and where I went would also affect their life who they may one day marry or what may be the outcome in their life. You can't haphazardly make decisions without some form of consequence in the end. Those of you tonight that God has pricked your heart and you've got some decisions you need to make, you need to know without a shadow of a doubt what God's will is. I want you to step out right now by faith and come to this altar. You say tonight is the night. I need to know some things.